a very sad sight indeed to see the pride of the Italian fleet wallowing here in the Atlantic Ocean. Coast Guard cutters and merchant ships rushed to the stricken liner and took off her 1,700 passengers and crew after desperate radio appeals told the world she was listing so fast that half her lifeboats could not be launched. at the ocean terminal as survivors are reunited with their friends and families. But behind the rejoicing, a question looms large that will have to be answered. How is it that one of the safest liners in the world collided in an ordinary fog and met her end in a matter of hours? miles off the New England coast, 225 feet beneath the surface, lie the shattered remains of a luxury liner, victim of a collision with another ship on a summer night in 1956, a disaster that took 50 passengers to their deaths. left one vital, haunting question. Who was to blame? The search for an answer begins in Genoa, Italy, on July 17, 1956. It is the Andrea Doria's 51st voyage. To Italians, the Andrea Doria is more than a ship. She is a floating symbol of the country's art, architecture, cuisine, and culture. Italy's finest ship is commanded by Italy's finest captain, Piero Calamai, a veteran of two world wars, descendant of a proud seagoing family. He has devoted 40 of his 58 years to the sea. He is the only master the Andrea Doria has ever known. Capitano, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Aboard a second officer, 29-year-old Guido Badano. I was a second officer junior, but uh, it was just one month. That was my third, uh, second trip and second and third crossing. Ah, but I've been uh, 13 months si, si, bello. before as a third officer, senior. At the time, I was in charge of the safety, so I was knowing the ship very well. Captain Calamai was a gentleman. He was a good seaman, a good captain, a good man. On this voyage, the Andrea Doria has a crew of 572 and carries 1,134 passengers. In first class, passenger Isa Santana is traveling with Annabel her seven-year-old daughter. The way we were treated uh, uh, in first class, it was the best of everything. Mr. Serra, he was the maitre d'. He was magnificent. And every time he saw us coming in on board, oh, how nice to see you again this year, etc. And it was very nice. It was, it was like being home, going home. For Merrill and Mike Stoller, a homeward cruise on the Andrea Doria is a fitting finale to a journey of celebration. My husband is a songwriter and we had gotten a windfall royalty and we'd been married for a year and decided before we started a family it would be lovely to go to Europe. And the song was black denim trousers and motorcycle boots. Edith Piaf had recorded it in France and we had European royalties and it was actually it was $5,000. In tourist class, immigrants such as Liliana Duner are making the journey for a new life in America. My husband was in the Navy. He was an American. 
live in, in Jersey. And I was going to come over and have a family. I was coming over with my daughter, my daughter Marianne. She was almost three years old. Nine-year-old Pat Mastrincola, traveling with his mother and sister, turns the ship into his personal playground. My father wasn't there to, you know, watch over me, so every opportunity uh, that I had, I would go exploring on all parts of the ship that you weren't allowed into. In other words, you're restricted to tourist classes. The area is blocked off. So I would climb on the outside railings and try to get into cabin class. And every time I thought that I was in, I'd get caught. It was like an ambush. They knew I was coming. Pat's knowledge of the ship will be crucial in the terrifying night to come. The voyage across the Atlantic offers the best of Italian courtesy and comfort. A luxurious trip on the most fashionable and elegant ship in the world. Even immigrants on their way to America enjoy the ship's pleasures. All three classes have swimming pools and white-vested waiters accommodating every need. For eight days, the ship makes her way west toward New York. Everything was perfect. Everything was perfect. It was like a luxury, a small city. Beautiful. It was a dream. July 25th, as the Andrea Doria nears the American coast, the Swedish liner Stockholm prepares to leave New York Harbor, bound for Sweden. With 534 passengers aboard, the Stockholm is the smallest liner on the Atlantic Highway. A tidy and practical vessel whose sharply pointed bow has been reinforced with steel to plow through icy Scandinavian seas. The Stockholm's captain is Harry Gunnar Nordensen. At 63, his experience rivals that of the Andrea Doria's captain, Kalamai. But it's Nordensen's destiny to be away from his bridge at the fatal moment. The man who will be in charge of the Stockholm as a young third officer with three months' experience on the Swedish ship, 26-year-old Johan Ernst Carstens Johansson. For decades, Carstens has refused to be interviewed about the collision. Now, he breaks his silence. You know, you can't build up a story around an, an accident like this and keep to it. That's impossible. As I see it, I, I know what I saw and I know what I did. But I, I never could try to, to fix it up. 11.31 a.m. The Stockholm leaves New York Harbor. She sails east, headed for an anchored marker, the Nantucket Lightship. Under the North Atlantic Track Agreement, eastbound boats are supposed to go 20 miles south of the lightship. But Sweden is not party to the agreement, and Captain Nordensen follows a shortcut he has sailed more than 400 times before, sailing only a mile south of the lightship. Afternoon on July 25th, inbound on the same course, the Andrea Doria is 15 hours from New York. The ship has now sailed into a massive fog bank, a condition common to the North Atlantic in the summer. 
Captain Kalamai orders the ship's speed reduced from 23 to 21.8 knots. International regulations require a much greater reduction, but few ships follow the rule. The rules uh, is a long talk about the rules. It is a general rule at that time, rule number 16, they say in case of fog, the speed must be reduced. Never had been followed. For Kalamai, like all passenger ship captains, time is money. He activates the radar to warn him of other ships in the fog. The radar will detect any ship within a 20 mile radius. Joining Kalamai for the evening watch, are his most experienced officers. The captain himself, in his trademark beret, will guide the Andrea Doria until the fog lifts. Eight thirty p.m. On the Stockholm, Third Officer Carstens arrives for his night watch. Carstens insists there was no fog around the Stockholm, or it would have been his duty to call Captain Nordensen to the bridge. I don't recall that we had fog. If I know it was fog, then I have called him long time ago. Carstens does not know that a huge fog bank lies directly in his path. The Stockholm is steaming full speed due east at 18 knots. At 9.20 p.m., the Nantucket lightship appears on the Andrea Doria's radar screen, 17 miles ahead. Kalamai orders a course one mile south of the lightship, the correct route for inbound ships. But this time, an oncoming vessel will be directly in his path. At 20 p.m., the Andrea Doria passes the Nantucket lightship, completely shrouded in fog. Now the Andrea Doria is in the home stretch. Ten thirty p.m., aboard the Stockholm, Carstens takes a position. The ship has drifted slightly north, nudged by the Atlantic currents. He orders a slight correction south to the right. She was drifting a little bit in against the American coast. So I changed course, I think, two degrees, but that's nothing. That was just a little bit. And what uh, I was waiting for, that was to see the light from Nantucket. So I could correct when we come up there. Ten forty five PM. The Stockholm appears on the Andrea Doria's radar for the first time. Guido Badano says the blip is to the right or starboard side of the Doria's course. Kalamai alters course to the left to give the ship a wider berth. And the blip was a seventeen miles away. It was a four degree to the starboard. We continue our course, then opened what we say that was opening the angle, so it became a 15 degrees to starboard. The practice on the Italian ship is to observe an oncoming vessel without plotting its speed and course. It is a routine that will contribute to catastrophe. Stockholm, Karstens now picks up a blip. But what he sees is the exact opposite to what is being seen on the Andrea Doria. He says she's to his left, or port. She was clear on, on the port side, and uh, I begin to plot her when she come near, and I realize that she will be clear on port side. That was not true. If you say that you see a ship on the port and the ship is on the starboard, this is not the truth. The 
the Doria case was a starboard to starboard situation, green to green, very simple. It is one of the world's busiest maritime highways, safely navigated by hundreds of ships every day. Yet tonight, two liners will meet in a fatal collision, a disaster that remains a bitter tangle of guilt and blame. We were supposed to dock. My husband was going off to play cards with some people, and I had promised to dance with some young Italian boys who were coming to the States for the first time. And they wanted to get some practice dancing, so I said I would stay up and I would dance with them. My daughter was asleep. I was up, and we were just about drinking the last drink for the trip anyway, and said, uh, good luck, etc. until we meet again. We was going to have a party. It was the end of the voyage. It was a babysitter watching the children in a room. And all at once I felt something was going to happen. The two ships are closing in. On the Andrea Doria, Captain Calamai decides to execute a right-to-right -right passing against the rules of the road because he considers the oncoming ship a safe distance away. He did nothing because there was nothing to do, because we passed 100 of ships in this way. When a ship is clear, it's clear. But he must continue with his course, uh, with the speed is his course. So he did nothing. 11.06 p.m. Karsten sees the Doria's lights barely two miles away. They indicate the ship is to his port on a safe route to pass left of the Stockholm. You have the top lights where you can see if that is going there or there. You have the aft and the forward one. And then you have the red lights on the port side and the green light on the starboard side. So I saw that the top lights was open. That was that she was clear and the red light. That was what I saw first. The lookout on the Stockholm calls Karstens to confirm this legal left-to-left -left passing. What happens next is the subject of hostile disagreement. Karstens claims he saw the Doria make a sharp, fatal turn across his bow. Then I saw the top lights. They were open, and I saw the red lights. So I was completely clear for passing. Then they changed, and then everything yet move around. I see on her top lights that she was turning, and then her green lights come up. And then it was no good. Rules require Captain Kalamai to turn right in a collision situation. But he instinctively orders hard left hoping to outrun the oncoming ship. And then it was nothing to do. So the Captain Calamai say hard to port, trusting his own, his own speed so fast that we had to say, maybe we can escape. With a target at 200 meters, <laughs> where you go? like an explosion and two tilted the ship that way i know it was bad they have to be bad something dreadful happened i remember the glass that i was holding flying out of my hand and i remember glass shattering before i know it i'm against the wall i've got chairs piling up against me tables people so i crawled up to where my mother was and she was saying, my baby, my baby. I says, I'm all right. She says, no, not you. Your sister just went down to the cabin. The knife-like bow of the Stockholm has penetrated 30 feet into the flank of the Andrea Doria. 
passenger cabins are crushed instantly. Walls are torn apart, beds shredded. Dozens of bloodied corpses fall into the sea, never to be recovered. In the first seconds, 40 people are killed. The cabin receiving the worst blow belongs to New York Times correspondent Camille Chanfara. He's killed instantly. His wife, Jane, is alive, trapped in the wreckage. Their daughter, Joan, flung like a doll into the sea. And stepdaughter, Linda, is missing in the debris. On the Stockholm, Captain Nordenson rushes to the bridge. He asked what's happened. And I tell him, and then uh, he began to sound the ship and check everything that, uh, and see for survivors up in our front and so on. The Swedish ship is severely damaged. 75 feet of her bow is crushed and torn away. Four crewmen are dead. Some of them we found, they were crashed in the collision. But the other one were down in the cabin. They must jump in through the sea or something. I don't know. You know, there were nobody who had a chance to, to uh, help them in the beginning when we didn't know what's happened to the ship. And everybody who was there insisted that we'd hit an iceberg, like the Titanic. And then, of course, those of us who were a little more sensible said that wasn't possible where we were. We could not possibly have hit an iceberg. The Andrea Doria is listing 22 degrees. Empty fuel tanks on one side of the ship provide no ballast against the inrush of seawater. Captain Kalamai is stunned. His ship is sinking. I can tell you this. Uh, my mother tried to get a crew member to go down to our cabin and get things. And he said, lady, he says, hey, deck is underwater. She's going to get anything out of there. The passenger I need to announce. Passenger must go to their master station, yeah, wearing their life belts and keep calm. I made it on the general uh, loudspeaker system. But in a collision like this, maybe there are wires that are cut. Uh, you don't know what uh, really, if the announcement arrived. Somewhere arrived. Nothing. Nothing. No messages, no life jackets. It was not a happy situation. Nobody was saying anything. That is what was, up, was upsetting me because I didn't know whether we were going to live or die or what. And I figured we're gonna die there. We are trapped there where we start screaming. the Stockholm stands off to avoid another impact. Consumed with the safety of his own vessel, Captain Nordensen does not contact the Andrea Doria. The Andrea Doria's severe list leaves half her lifeboats useless. Captain Kalamai does not give an order to abandon ship, as only half his passengers would stand a chance of survival. puts out a desperate call for help. Ships in the area race to the rescue. The first is the freighter Cape Anne, with only two lifeboats. Another is the Navy ship Private William H. Thomas. Henry Talbot is an 18-year-old student spending a summer aboard the Thomas. I would guess it was probably around 11.30 at night we were called to man our lifeboat stations, and then the word started to get around before the announcement was made that there had been a, a collision at sea. 45 miles to the east, on a course for Europe, is the only ship big enough to help. The Ile de France, at 46,000 tons, is one of the largest liners afloat. Her captain 
Raoul de Baudin makes a decision that will make him a hero. He ignores his own schedule, turns his ship around, back toward the sinking Andrea Doria. It will take him over two hours to reach her, a race against time, with 1,700 lives hanging in the balance. One hour after the collision with the Andrea Doria, the Swedish liner Stockholm is no longer in danger. Captain Nordensen orders lifeboats sent to the sinking ship. And this is really what added to the turret. The fact that it was nighttime, it was foggy, and you could not see or know what was going on. So you were like on death row. Then the American Navy ship Thomas reaches the scene. And then the fog really started to lift. And we could make out clearly the outline of the engine door. It was listing very badly in huge hole inside. And you could see people sliding down this deck and into the water. Sight. I was dead. I mean, I was convinced that I was going to die. I wished it had happened sooner. And I do remember saying to Mike, and he chose to forget it, that I was sorry I was not in that airplane crash over Denver, because then I would have died instantly, and I wouldn't have had to wait to die. Oh, God, it was a lot of panic. You don't know if the ship was going to sink any second. 1.45 a.m., nearly three hours after the collision. A beacon of hope. I'm sitting on the fan tail of the ship looking towards the rear of the ship. That's all I can see. All of a sudden, the fog just opens up, and in gigantic letters, Ile de France. A gigantic ocean liner, I mean, it's bigger than the Andrea Doria. And now people, uh, this really moved everyone. I mean, people were clapping and cheering. We said, now we have a fighting chance. Lifeboats shuttle back and forth, frantically evacuating more than 1,600 passengers and crew. It is the greatest sea rescue in peacetime history. To escape the sinking ship, Liliana Duner ties a rope around her three-year-old daughter, Marianne. We're going to lower her down, and we start screaming. I say, any life from both, it will come by. She start crying. We, we start calling, we screaming. The rope slips. Now I jump in. Now I don't know if I got Marianne half away, but I know I was in the water with Marianne. I know we went under. We went underwater. But I got ahead. One of the crewmen threw himself in. Got me and Marianne. They lifted me over the side of the ship. And the only way I got down that ladder was that Mike came after me and kept stepping on my hands so that I had to keep moving them. I don't know how that lifeboat got into the water, but it was there. And it was waiting underneath this ladder. said to the French uh, crew member, as soon as she got in the boat, we sat down. She said to this French crew member, she says, oh, thank God we're saved. And you looked up, and there's the Andrea Doria, you know, leaning over your head, and the French crew member says to my mother, he says, ma'am, if this thing goes over, we're done. He says, you're not saved yet. Just before dawn on the North Atlantic, the Andrea Doria is almost deserted. Only a few senior officers remain. Guido Badano senses that his captain intends to die on the ship. He spoke with me personally during the long period we stayed together. A certain talk surprised me because a certain moment after the France arrived, he told me, if you go back to Genoa, you will meet my daughter, tell them that I did what I was to do, what I think I was to do. Badano convinces Calamai to leave, but the captain's career at sea is over.
As the captain and his officers leave the sinking liner, dozens of reporters and camera crews are arriving by boat, plane, and helicopter drawn to the death watch of the Andrea Doria. There was a media frenzy there. I've never seen so many helicopters, uh, small airplanes, fishing boats. There must have been 150 different craft in the area when we left. Coast Guard helicopters airlift the most critically injured, including a three-year-old girl, Norma DeSandro, dropped on her head into a lifeboat by her panicked father. Captain Nordenson steers the Stockholm toward New York, with 545 survivors from the Andrea Doria crowding her decks. The Italian liner lies abandoned in the Atlantic, slowly dying. The fact that the Andrea Doria stayed afloat for 10 hours is extraordinary. It's a miracle. Every sea captain that pulled up to rescue us had never seen a ship list that far and stay afloat. 10.09 a.m. The ship begins her final plunge. Her last instants are captured in a series of haunting photographs that will win the Pulitzer Prize. something uh, very, very sad. By 26, 1956, on the Hudson River docks, thousands of New Yorkers gather in desperation. No one yet knows how many lives have been lost in the collision. Then, at 6 p.m., the mighty Ile de France steams into the harbor. Captain de Baudien of the Ile de France is the hero of the greatest sea rescue in peacetime history. He has brought 753 survivors from the Andrea Doria. Three other ships bring the roster of the living to more than a thousand. First things, I saw the Statue of the, Li the Liberty. I don't know why I saw, you know, the land and the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I think so everybody that cry very is silent, and I know how I was safe. But the joy of reunion is darkened as the news spreads. Fifty-two people are still unaccounted for. ABC Radio news anchor Edward Morgan is informed that his ex-wife Jane and daughter Linda are among the missing. Traumatized, he bravely goes on air his garbled report revealing personal grief. Good evening. Here is the shape of the news. Tonight, it is the shape of disaster. This is a jumbled story. Take, for instance, a particular case, the case of a person who had person's relatives aboard the Andrea Doria and was notified this morning that the two ships, the Stockholm and the Andrea Doria, had collided in fog last night. The death count is not fully known until the Stockholm limps into New York Harbor a day later. Jubilation for the families of the living. Anguish for the families of the dead. heroism in rescuing her daughter makes her an instant sensation with the press. I see my baby in the water, I jump for the ship. Take my baby in the water, I swim. All, all, I go on a boat. For another family, tragedy. The DeSandros rush to hospital to see their three-year-old daughter, Norma. She dies before they arrive. stories, 
none is as unlikely as the miracle of Linda Morgan. Asleep on the dory as the two ships collide, Linda has been flung onto the mangled bow of the Stockholm, where she is found alive. An incredible deliverance announced to the nation by her own father. Within the space of 24 hours, this reporter has been pushed down the elevator shaft to the sub-basement of despair and raised again to the heights of incredible joy. The daughter of this reporter, Linda Morgan, accounted for one of the incidents of the tragedy which some would classify as a miracle. On September 19, 1956, the inquiry begins in New York. A marathon of accusation and denial. Italian versus Swede. Johann Carstens Johansson is the first witness. I think it was 11 days. I don't recall exactly how many days and how many lawyers it was. After Carstens, Captain Piero Calamai fares no better on the stand. On his ship's speed in the fog, on failing to plot the Stockholm's course, and on neglecting to bring the logbooks from the Andrea Doria, this critical oversight casts a shadow on the Italian case. Without the ship's logs, the Italians lack vital documentary evidence. They broke Calamari all the time. The lawyers in the court's examination, he changed his story all the time. After three months of argument and contradiction, the inquiry is abandoned. The lines pay six million dollars to passengers in out-of-court settlements, saving them more than a hundred million. It's a prudent business-like settlement, but to this day, it has never officially been established who made the fatal error. Forty years later, the inquiry gives American nautical experts the raw material needed to reconstruct the collision. Today, at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in New York, the testimony of both Calamai and Carstens has been analyzed, a computer simulation of the disaster created. Uh, my name is Captain Robert Murren. I'm a professor of uh, nautical science at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. We're in uh, the KORF simulator. The simulator is used to train American navigators in disaster situations. Here, they relive the minutes leading up to the Andrea Doria Stockholm collision from Karsten's perspective. the MV Stockholm outbound from New York on the night of July 25th, 1956. It was near the end of Carson Johansson's 20 to 24 watch. Carson Johansson was at the chart desk and he was plotting his 2300 radio direction finder fix. After plotting his fix, Carson's returned to the radar scope to see if there were any contacts on the radar. On the radar scope, he observed a pip just to the right of his heading flasher. He plotted this contact at 12 miles away. According to the simulation, Costins has made an innocent error that triggers disaster. He has his radar set on the wrong range scale. He believes he is 12 miles away from the unseen ship with plenty of time to turn right for a safe port-to-port -port passing. In fact, he's less than four miles away. At a combined speed of 40 knots, the ships are closing in a mile every 90 seconds. There is no time for a safe turn. The lookout telephones to report the sound of another yep. ship's foghorn, but the ship still cannot be seen. The ship moves to the left on the radar. 
and Costins believes he is safe. This would indicate to him that it was going to be a safe meeting situation, port to port. In reality, what he was doing was altering course to starboard and crossing the bow of the inbound Andrea Doria. To increase his margin of safety, Costins turns further to the right. Costins is maneuvering in strict observance of the rules of the road. Captain Calamai is less rigid about these rules, holding to his decision to execute a starboard to starboard passing at almost full speed, only a mile separating him from a ship he cannot see through the fog. On the Stockholm, Costins cannot understand why the other ship's lights are not visible. He again took his binoculars, went to the center window, in the hopes of seeing a red side light off his port bow. The phone rang from the lookout. Costins expects to see the ship's red side light safely moving away to his left. Instead, to his horror, he sees the green light, the massive luxury liner crossing in front of him. Johan Carstens Johansson does not accept the theory that he misused his radar. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. You have, uh, what was 20 range, 12 mile, 3 mile, and I changed them all the time since I saw it. Because when we come nearer and nearer, you change. To this day, he is sure of what he saw. The Andrea Doria making an illegal left turn across his bow. They saw me. They must see me. And I, they said that they saw me. But they, they didn't plot anything. I don't know exactly what's happened there. That is so confusing. For there was uh, so many people. There was the captain, the second mate, another second mate, and I don't know how many there was. I mean, they cannot miss me. I, I don't know what, what was going on there. Human memory versus nautical science. The disaster will never be fully explained. Today, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy teaches the Andrea Doria Stockholm disaster as a textbook example of radar-assisted collision. In the aftermath, strict rules about sea lanes approaching and leaving the United States are implemented, training of all bridge crews on radar navigation is enforced, and liners on the North Atlantic are equipped with bridge-to-bridge, captain-to-captain radios. Carstens goes on to become a captain of passenger and cargo ships and retires in Sweden with a record as clear as his conscience. Guido Badano also rises to the rank of captain before retiring in Genoa, Italy. The Andrea Doria's Captain Calamai would never go to sea again. He dies in 1972, muttering his final words, are the passengers safe? One year after the collision, the Stockholm gets a new bow at the cost of $1 million. She still sails the Atlantic with chilling irony as the Italia Prima, an Italian passenger liner. The Andrea Doria lies still and silent, a broken remnant of a collision that never should have happened. Experts and survivors will continue to look for answers, but they cannot bring back the dazzling ship and an era of elegance lost forever.